Catoctin Creek is a proud supporter of Bourbon Pursuit. At Catoctin Creek, they pride themselves on making traditional rye whiskey as it would have been made in the 1800s. Virginia grain, Virginia water, Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. This is brought to you by Smooth Ambler, a proud member of the Bourbon Pursuit family. Smooth Ambler builds on the traditional roots of American whiskey through innovative blends, proudly sourced whiskeys, and a unique line of their own homemade bourbon and rye recipes made in West Virginia. So venture off the traditional trail and go see them in Maxwellton, West Virginia. They'd love to welcome you to the family that they're building around their whiskey. Wilderness Trail is sweet mash Kentucky straight bourbon and rye whiskey made by master distiller Shane Baker and fermentation expert Dr. Pat Heist. Whether it is high rye or weeded, cask strength or bottled and bond, Wilderness Trail is always non-chill filtered premium whiskey with unparalleled flavor. Distilled, aged and bottled in Danville, Kentucky. Whew, man, who would have known we switched the uh, round table to Sunday night instead of Monday night? Man, it was in a calendar. Much, uh, <laughs> four of us did, Blake. The four of us did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is episode 311 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's episode, with the 58th Bourbon Community Roundtable, here's your weekly bourbon news update. Five distilleries are coming together to release a one-of-a-kind bourbon series celebrating Bardstown. Heaven Hill, Jim Beam, Bardstown Bourbon Company, Preservation, and Log Still Distilleries have joined forces to create a collaborative project where each distiller is committed to selecting a premium bourbon to represent their company's best. It's going to be bottled in custom packaging that celebrates the community and the history of Bardstown. The project will be bottled at Bardstown Bourbon Company's new 55,000 square foot bottling facility, then made available for purchase exclusively at on-site of each distillery's visitor center in September, and all proceeds from the release will be donated back to the Bardstown community. George Dickel Tennessee Whiskey is unveiling a new permanent expression to its lineup, an eight-year-old bourbon bottled at 90 proof, using their standard mash bill of 84% corn, 8% rye, and 8% malted barley, and has a suggested retail price of $33. In the celebrity bourbon train, it keeps rolling along, but this time featuring NBA all-star Scotty Pippen, and the release is called Digits. The product is a blend of five-year-old bourbon from Savage and Cook, who we just selected barrel with last week. It's bottled at 94 proof and will launch in Chicago the week of June 21st. Watershed Distillery out of Columbus, Ohio is releasing its bottled and bond bourbon for $50 and is also releasing a second bourbon, which is a blend of Watershed Standard Bourbon with its six-year-old Apple Brandy Finished Bourbon and another Source Bourbon at 90 proof for $40. These will be available in Ohio, Georgia, Illinois, Kentucky, Michigan, and New York. And as the bourbon world has progressed with popularity, the round table, well, we come together to discuss how should we be pricing bourbon? And is there a good formula that can make everyone happy? And with all the new source brands that are on the market, and with more and more investors coming in every week to buy barrels, what will the source market look like here in just a few years? Are we gonna be oversaturated? And lastly, we examine the business side of the industry, and we try to figure out who's more important, the master distiller or the salesperson. Barrel Bourbon is known for their expertise in crafting unique blends, taking lots of different whiskeys from different regions and bottling it at cask strength. And you can even buy them online. Just visit BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. With that, enjoy today's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Mike Pastor. Uh, Mike writes me on fredminnick.com. He's got a bourbon club and wants to know how to get into the barrel picking game. He's seeing all these people uh, talk about doing barrel picks, and he wants to get up in it. Here's the deal. Uh, Mike lives in Pennsylvania, kind of like a dead zone for a lot of the cool things in bourbon, and I mean that by no offense uh, to anybody who lives in Pennsylvania. That's an incredible state, but your uh, your alcohol system there kind of hates you, you know. So it's a control state, and while you may get a few things um, at an SRP that the rest of us do not get, 
They are very controlling in terms of how things go. So the only way that you can do a barrel pick is if you go through your your ABC store or your government controlled store. And I'm not even sure how that works because they have to go through the entire bureaucracy of bureaucrat. And so I would I would suggest uh, getting connecting with a private liquor store that does barrel picks and running your uh, barrel pick through there. Uh, another uh, opportunity is to join uh, the Bourbon Pursuit uh, Patreon community. And, you know, maybe you'll uh, get to come on a barrel pick with uh, Kenny and Ryan. And, you know, that's always a good time. But so that's a way to get in the barrel picking world. You really have to go through a retailer or a restaurant, but mostly a retailer to, you know, to get in on the action. And uh, because you cannot, you cannot, actually buy it yourself um and you know the actual barrel yourself you have to go through a retail system so that's the way it works it's really not that complicated even though there's some layers of complexity to it but it's a pretty easy process but uh thank you so much mike for that great uh question uh if you're like mike and would like to have your question read on the air hit me up on fredminnick.com that's fredminnick.com until next week cheers everybody Welcome, everybody, to the 58th Bourbon Community Roundtable. Kenny, Fred, and Ryan all here tonight to be able to talk about some fun and interesting topics. We got a little bit of a skeleton crew tonight, but that's okay. We've got Jordan from Breaking Bourbon here again as well. Jordan, how are you? Good, good. Thanks for having us, Kenny. Yeah. So we don't have Brian tonight uh, from Sip and Corn. Brian is dealing with a, what do you say, there is a, a kitchen... Uh, line or a, a pipe that burst in his kitchen that then started flooding into his basement. And I said, he's like, he's unfortunately, I don't think I can make it. I said, I, that's okay. This is, that's a little understandable. I'll, I'll, I'll let you have it. That's one hell of a father's day gift. Ah, tell me about it. <laughs> Deal with this leaky pipe all day. <laughs> Clean up all the shit. Yeah. It's a tough one. That's a tough one. And then our Cal Ripken, you know, between 19 kids and five different jobs, I'm surprised he remembers <laughs> us on a on a night when we usually have it scheduled. And, and 50 varieties of meat on a Weber. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Very mm-hmm. true. Very true. But who knows? Hey, he we're might... going. We're going for quality, not quantity tonight. You know, we got four quality. Ooh, Ooh, I like it. Dang. Uh, uh, Cecil just saying that you know dropping it like it's hot on on Blake here saying like he's gonna lower the quality is that what I'm hearing there it's like uh, I think, I think that's I like what I'm picking up I don't know like we'll that. keep it silent <laughs> 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 he's just smiling looking away <laughs> oh, man. that's awesome all right so uh, let's kind of dig into this so this first kind of topic I, I got into because Fred had a really good video. He's got these uh, your Friday hot takes, and there was one you did about two weeks ago that talked about two hundred dollar bourbon and how did we get here? You yeah. kind of want to give just a little bit of a background on that because the the topic that we're going to get into is how should we appropriately price bourbon? Yeah, so that uh, that that segment is just kind of like it's just just me ranting about something random and. Uh, I was uh, just walking through the store getting uh, getting Jacqueline, her old Forester in 1920, and I saw uh, Blue Run uh, and like five other products, you know, that would not have been on the shelf two years ago. And they're like 200 bucks. And and then they're then behind the glass case, you know, is more 200 and 200 up whiskey. And I was like, I was like, holy shit. And, and I know how we got here, you know, it's, uh, I know the economics of it all. And, and Kenny and Ryan, you know, it, you know, better than anybody on this program because you all are, you know, bottling whiskey, but it just, uh, man, I, I, I hate to be the old guy saying like, I remember when it was like this, but I, I, I kind of re I want to reiterate, I used to pay 20 bucks for well or 12 year old in, you know, 15, 16 years ago. And it just, it just like, it's, it's, it amazes it. I don't know what it was, but the other day when I did that, it just absolutely amazed me that, that we are here. And I just feel like we are, we are teetering on the edge of, uh, you know, bourbon outpricing what it is because you know, wild tur you know, there's not many $200 bourbons that are better than Knob Creek, wild Turkey 101 or four rows of single barrel. 
and those products will never, you know, leap to the two hundred dollar price point. Well, you know, I think you made an interesting point too, Fred. It's not so up until even a year ago, two years ago, anything over like a hundred, hundred fifty, it was behind the behind the counter, behind glass, small selection, right? And now you walk through stores, and yeah, you still see stuff behind the glass, and that's even more pricey than two hundred bucks usually. But you'll just see two hundred dollars sitting on the shelf, buck fifty, two hundred dollars. It's starting to become complacency for everyone just seeing, and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's kind of what bourbon costs now. Where in the past, you'd see the price, you go, man, that's outrageous. And then you go pick up a $40 bottle. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm seeing a lot more 90, 120, 150, 200. I guess, I guess this is the price. And then the crazy thing is, and I'm sure you guys see it as much as we do, well, if people, you know, more and more, especially over the last year, they want to get a really nice bottle of bourbon, I want to spend $150, $200. Where in the past, it was, hey, what can, you know, what's a good bottle of bourbon cost? We say, here's a great one for 60 bucks. We'll still recommend bottle of knob or something else to say, no, 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 I want to spend more money. I want to get something good. So that that quality of price, all of a sudden people are equating like, oh, I pay more, I get better. And that's that's never been the case with bourbon, but I'm afraid consumers are starting to equate the two in their head, which is just as disaster. Like that's that's a shame. And I remember I've shared this story in the past, but I was in um I was in uh, Total Wine and uh helping a lady get a get a bottle and I was basing it on like what they what she liked to taste and drink and normally. And I recommended a a four roses. And she said, but it's so cheap. And I was just kind of like, oh no, actually, it's it's really, really good. And so she she went and got something that it was a source product. And I for the life of me, I can't remember what it is right now, but she got a source product that was twice as expensive and probably a year or two younger. And, and I just, there's so much of that that happens. Um, and people have this belief that the more expensive is better. Now that, that being said, there are brands, uh, like Fourgate that are doing things that are absolutely exceptional. And, you know, I can make an argument that some of their batches are worth $200. You know, if we look at the, if we look at the total market, I can make an argument for some of that kind of stuff. But that's it. That's I think that's a little bit more on the minority side. Most of the stuff that's coming out now that's two hundred bucks and more is just not worth it. I feel Forget gets a pass because they do a lot more with the whiskey than anybody else. It's not just they take something that's you know sourced, yeah, yeah. put in a bottle, put a label on it, and just put it out there. I mean, they are they're doing collaborations with Kelvin Cooperage. They're trying to find different. I mean, everybody's got to have their angle. Like, what is what is it makes this different? And I think Forgate gets a pass uh, because of that. And to kind of dovetail what you were saying on there earlier, Fred, is that bourbon was really like the common man's whiskey. It wasn't the overaged, overpriced scotch or anything like that. This was something that was an easily approachable whiskey for most of the consumer base out there. And I feel that you are right. We are starting to start tread on that market. And we are starting to figure out or, you know, a lot of the bigger brands are starting to see, well, these craft distillers are coming out and their bottles are $80. Why are ours 25 or 30 when we have a higher age product and we could be pushing that envelope a little bit further? I don't know if we'll see the the end of uh, bottom shelves or anything like that. Like, I have no idea, but they are always getting rebranded continually by a lot of these distilleries because they do see that you know whether you're putting a six year old product in a bottle, that could probably be worth way more than fifteen or eighteen dollars what we considered once paying. Yeah, and this is could be this could be a little bit of growing pains. And the fact is, is that this has traditionally been the uh, everyday person's you know buy in the in the liquor store. You know, scotch has always been priced well above eighty bucks. You know, for the most part, there's some value in scotch. Don't get me wrong but it's generally far more expensive than bourbon. And now that the, the demand for bourbon has, you know, risen to the point where, uh, you know, secondary markets were formed because people couldn't find things, you have, um, you have the industry still kind of clinging on to some of the pricing. And like in that video, I made the point that Wild Turkey 101 is the exact same price uh, in, as it was in the late 1990s. Uh, maker's mark if you uh add inflation is the you know is the same price uh, you know with inflation as it was in 2000 so there the industry 
is very they're going to keep that core price point of 15 to 30 bucks i believe in that and for the for the entry level and then everything after what's very interesting about this is that they can't get together and talk about how to um how to work on this as an industry because in the 40s and 50s the price fixing scandals that pappy van winkle ironically pappy van winkle was one of the leaders in like uh you know making bringing light to this uh but he testified before you know congress and the senate about like how the larger companies were doing price fixing scandals to price out like the smaller distillers and and so there's all of these laws now that they can't they can't uh basically fix pricing and that's also one of the reasons why the distillers are not supposed to uh, dictate to uh, uh, liquor stores on what to do. But we, you know, m remember my air quotations if you are just <laughs> listening to this. But um, Yeah, well, I, Ron, I actually want to put this question to you because we still haven't answered the question is how should we appropriately price bourbon? <laughs> Well, I mean, we can talk from a basics of e economics, uh, you know, so, you know, it's, you're, you're out to make money, obviously, with these. So, you know, any consultant or accountant that I've worked with in our my four businesses says you need to be at a probably a, on the very low end of 40 percent gross margin. And, uh, you know, and to be in a healthy business, you need to be at a 50, 55 percent gross margin. And so you know, gross margin is basically your cost of goods sale, you know, uh, which is your products, your bottle, your liquid, whatnot. And then after that, you know, you need to have that margin left over to cover overhead expenses. And then you hope by a healthy business has about 10% net profit margin after you got your overhead expenses are covered. And, you know, some businesses will price products as cut loss leaders. So they'll say, Hey, we're going to go out and we're going to price bottles less to make less money or no money just to get our brand out there to say, you know, they consider it a marketing expense. And then some, you know, who actually want to make money and be viable in the industry price it correctly, but they're being new, you know, and, and, you know, we're in the source market. So we understand why these bottles are at $200, uh, you know, because the cost of goods sold that there's just a huge gap in, aged inventory right now you know you got a ton of four-year whiskey and younger in the source market and you have very little that's 10 years plus you know and so those barrels are just astronomically expensive and so your cost of goods sold on that is just crazy and the, the bigger distillers have such an advantage because their cost of goods sold are so less like heaven hill i think they make barrels for you know with the with the barrel and the you know, the grain in the mash bill for probably less than $200 a barrel. And, you know, whereas somebody like four gate or, uh, blue, whatever, what was the blue butterfly blue, blue run, run. <laughs> blue run spirits, blue run, you know, you're paying upwards of 4,000 to $6,000 a barrel, you know, and, and you've, and it's a 12 year old product that may or may not have, it maybe has a hundred bottles in it. Maybe it has 150, maybe it has 120, maybe it has nothing. And so, you know, your cost of per unit is, you know, just going to be higher. And so that's, that's, so, uh, you know, with that in mind, that's like a healthy business should have, you know, about a 10 to 15% net margin after all. So, you know, if you're in the source game, you're going to be more expensive. So how can you justify that? Well, you can say, well, you have somebody like Kenny and I, or somebody's palette or somebody's blending in saying, these are like why it's worth that because it is special or it is unique. Or you do what a lot of people are doing, just saying, oh, we're going to buy it, dump it in a bottle and say it's expensive and people are going to buy it anyways because it's 12-year-old whiskey and there's put, not much of put, it out there. You put super rare on it and people like, absolutely. You know, I mean, great-grandma's yeah. recipe doesn't come cheap there, Ryan. <laughs> oh, I know. Exactly. <laughs> and so I, I don't know. You know, these bigger distillers have an advantage because they can price at a much lower rate and still make great margins and scale. And the, the smaller guys have a harder time because, you know, they have their cost of goods are so high and they don't have scale, and they got to make a profit. So I don't know. I didn't mean to give a lecture on pricing. And yeah, I mean, I think that's a great. I think that was actually a great, you know, point from the from the business side of it. From from the consumer side, I think that is where you know we're on like we're in like new terrain for 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 bourbon. How they used to price, 
uh, is that they would price based on like where they wanted to be on the shelf. And most new brands wanted to be next to Woodford Reserve or Maker's Mark because those are the two brands that get the most eyeballs in most stores. And, uh, you know, now, now it, I, f- I feel like it's kind of like, all right, let's see what we can get away with. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. and whatever let's, the let's give it a shot. A hundred percent. Yeah, you keep, I mean, Willett's doing, you know, done that, you know, they're like, and I don't know if they found their, I don't know if they found their ceiling. They keep slowly, you know, poking the bear with their family estates and people keep lining up. They sell out instantly and it's like, okay, you know, and it's because it's that high age, you know, rare whiskey and, you know, comes in the foil. It's great stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it, the pricing stuff's all over and, I don't understand it all. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up Willet. I Willet was always fun. I remember, you know, years ago when you could go to the the actual gift shop there and it was ten dollars per year. And that honestly back then that was kind of fair. It, for most of us, that's a reasonable expectation of what you could pay per year or pay per a bottle. And they were still making probably healthy margins on it. So as a consumer, I thought ten dollars a year, that seemed like a pretty fair little roundabout thing. Now, Fred, this is a good question for you because uh, our good friend DJ Rarebird 101 put this in here is that do we think celebrity whiskey might be playing a big part of this because we do see a lot of celebrity whiskey coming out. Price points are a little bit varied. They're all over the place. I know Brothers Bond Bourbon is somewhere in like the $30, $35 range. You've got Sweeten's Cove, which is 200 plus. So there's really no healthy media or healthy middle right here. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, uh, E40's uh, bourbon, uh, Kuiper Belt, I think that's a $100 price point. That's a little bit more palatable for me. Uh, and it's eight year. He got eight year. He's got a lot of eight year uh, Kentucky bourbon. And I mean, I don't know who got his barrels, but it's freaking unbelievable, um, you know, for what's out there in the market. Info after this. What, <laughs> what's we need that? better brokers. We I need, need that, better I need brokers. Bro- I need E40's broker. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he, he, I might. Uh, he might find me later and kick my ass if I shared that. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but he's got a he's got a, his own little empire going in, in the booze business. Um, but I do think I do think celebrities they command a certain price point because they have to get paid, and and the way most of those deals are set up with the celebrities, either they if the ones that. Uh, where they buy into it, the the price point is lower usually. The ones where the brand is licensing them, uh, like the Matthew McConaughey deal, you know, I mean, he's licensed, but he's also getting, you know, he's got a piece of Long Branch. I don't know the exact details, but uh, but most of them, it is a the distillery takes the takes the risk, does all the does all the costs. And they, it's a 50-50 split on the profits. And so they will typically uh, price those so, you know, everybody gets a little coin in the bank. And, you know, with the celebrities, you know, they got to pay out the the managers, uh, all these people. And so that having a celebrity connected to it does can increase pricing. But it just depends on the, on, on the deal. Um, I, I think overall, the celebrity thing is not going away. Oh, like everyone, bigger. Bigger. Yeah. It's gonna get bigger. Yeah. I mean, I th- everyone keeps talking about people are getting tired of it. People inside the industry are getting tired of it. But those celebrities, their audiences, um, is um they're they're being touched for the first time. And RJ points out that uh McConaughey is a, is a wild turkey employee and um there's a kickback kind of thing. He's their cra- he so and they hired McConaughey, he was the highest paid, and he still might be creative director in the entire advertising industry, like, yeah. period. So they, they pay that's, him a lot. Yeah, I mean, that's like, you can call him an employer or whatever. You're, he's getting licensed. I mean, how, however you want to frame it. But it's um, those, all, all the celebrity deals are very different. Like the Rocks Tequila, that's his money. Uh, Conor McGregor's thing that just sold for 600 million proper 12 it, it it was uh you know that was largely i mean that was some of his money in there uh so the metallica that's their money with blackened you know so where you when you see the celebrities have have skin in the game as we like to say in business their price point tends to be lower 
True. Very, very true. Plus, you know, I think the the thing is that, at least from a consumer side and for us that are, it, quote unquote, in the industry here is that we have to be careful about celebrity whiskey because if people go and they buy it and they don't like it and that's what they think all bourbon tastes like, then it just ruins them for exploring the category. Yeah, I'm I'm all I'm all for like making sure that the uh, the whiskey's good, and and like just keep it at that. You know, it, it, the price point's going to be the price point with them. That's almost like a that's almost like a sub subcategory of of the category. And and Sweetens Co is is interesting to me because it has like six celebrities on it. So so i mean you know it's like these guys got together you know playing golf drinking bourbon all it's like hey, why don't we just start a bourbon all right let's trademark it. let's do it right now you know so it's kind of uh uh it is kind of uh interesting from 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 their perspective but i mean they're kind of in a category of their own though too with pulling a marianne yeah and, and helping i mean they actually went about it in a much different way than other celebrities have so which i agree is very interesting yeah, yeah and and in sweetens cove is you know Let's face it. There's a lot of those dickle barrels on the market, and and you know, and everyone who uses the dickle dickle whiskey is going to have going to have to face the same uh, same things. Like, well, I can go to Benny's and get 15 year old dickle for you know a quarter of that. I don't know, not anymore. There's not uh, not a ton of it out there, and that I, I just don't think the pricing thing will improve because of the the stocks of aged whiskey just can't meet the demand and. By the time it fixes itself out, we'll be so used to paying high prices, it won't it won't correct itself, you know. So I don't know. Well, you brought up a really good point. And kind of our, our next point of topic here, and that's the future of the sourced whiskey market. And that's because I had a lot of great conversations this week. I had traveled down to our our warehouse and traveled to a few different distilleries to kind of pop in and say hi. I just had a nice long conversation about really where do we think this is headed? And there are some good conversations, especially about the Kentucky side of things, because there is right now, it's not, it's not a, it's, everybody knows that Bardstown Bourbon Company, Wilderness Trail, you name it, there's a lot. And I mean, even the big boys that aren't doing direct sourcing, everybody's putting a ton and ton and ton of new make right here down or down right now. And you've got people that are in this as just investor barrels. They will go and they'll, find a million dollars and they'll put down a bunch of barrels and they'll say in four years, we're going to turn this around and we're going to sell these barrels for $3,000 a piece because that's what the market's going to dictate. Now, it's kind of hard to look on our magic eight ball or crystal ball here and figure out, well, what will the future be like here in four years? But there are some people that will think that, yeah, the, the market might bear $3,000 a barrel. And then there's the other side of it that says, well, not only you, but the other 400 people that are just like you that are putting down invested barrels that are thinking they're going to turn around in four years, that price point might drop down to about $1,500 a barrel because there's just going to be so much on the open market that it could be saturated uh, faster than we know it. So Fred, when you brought up that point about the Dickel barrels and Ryan saying that they're not available anymore, that's very true. Plus Dickel is starting to come out with their own high age expressions. So they are probably not going to be releasing a lot of those to the open market uh, much longer. Well, never, never underestimate Diageo's ability to screw up their own American whiskey uh, <laughs> project. But, but they seem to be. I mean, whatever Diageo is doing with with Bullet, uh, to me, Bullet is like it, it's it's on a run that could it could uh, take the number one spot in the within ten years. They are just crushing it with that. So I don't. I see Diageo really putting a lot of interest in the in the American whiskey portfolio for the first time in my career. Uh, they are really putting a lot of effort into it, it outside of just like cocktailing. I mean, they're really amping their game up and and its own bullet. And if if they if they can do Dickel right, you know, I mean, watch out. I mean, they could have like an incredible portfolio and who knows, maybe they make an acquisition or two, but um, if they are getting more aggressive in, in American whiskey, you know, that will, that will drop prices, you know, everywhere because their, their game plan is to saturate the market with like, you know, Johnny Walker black um, and Johnny Walker black. It's a very affordable scotch, you know? So that's, 
kind of their game. And if um, if we if we see Dickel kind of get taken off the market, then you'll see the Tennessee Distillers, you know, pick up where where they left off in the, in that category. So, and Dickel is definitely interesting because you know I was just down in North Carolina the other week and rows and rows of fifteen year old, as far as I could see, for sixty bucks, right? And you're like. I'm just going to rip from the source for 60 bucks and, you know, right next to it's a source one going, and you know, it's Dickel too, going for double the price with less age on it. And you just scratch your head going, well, what the hell is going on here? So, and, you know, there's a lot of other folks out there who aren't, who, who aren't into whiskey and bourbon in general, right? American whiskeys, and they're seeing this and they have no idea what's going on. So then they're really confused because they see cheap price, old age statement and they're, and they're scratching the head going, I thought I'm supposed to pay more, but higher age is better. And I don't know what to do. So it's it's confusing the average consumer left and right. They're, they're just not sure what to think. It's going to be interesting to see more and more of that too. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call on a pinch hitter here. So just go ahead and tap the left arm because we got Blake. Finally made it. <laughs> <laughs> He's in. Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53 gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. Total Wine & More is ready for summer. They've got all your pours for the great outdoors, like their top 12 wines under $15. And raise a glass to America with a star-spangled selections of sips made in the USA. And beat the heat with refreshing bourbon cocktails. Why not mix it up and serve a brown derby or a peachy keen at your next barbecue? Then taste your way to a new flavorant, like ready-to-freeze cocktail pops and fun, fizzy hard seltzers. Lime, pineapple, and peach, anyone? So no matter if you're grilling, chilling, or both, you're sure to find cool prices on over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers. In-store or TotalWine.com. Heaven Hill Distillery just launched a 3D behind-the-scenes tour of their Bernheim Distillery, the largest independent family-owned bourbon distillery in the world. See for yourself how they produce 1,553 gallon barrels of new make whiskey per day before it makes its way to the barrel for aging. From grain trucks to copper stills, drop into this 3D experience at heavenhilldistillery.com and navigate your way around the distillery for a step-by-step -step look at how they craft their award-winning lineup of American whiskeys. Heaven Hill reminds you, think wisely, drink wisely. Cheers. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call on a pinch hitter here. So just go ahead and tap the left arm because we got Blake finally made it. <laughs> <laughs> He's in. Whew, man, who would have known we switched the uh, round table to Sunday night instead of Monday night? Man, it was in a pretty much uh, everybody. Four of us did, Blake. The four of us did. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I've got to get this switched over to uh, my correct email address. The bourboner email is uh, now defunct, apparently, and nothing comes through because, yeah. So we're, we're talking about, uh, we've already kind of covered how do you appropriately price bourbon in today's market. Then we're talking about right now the, the future of sourced whiskey. And we've seen what's been happening with, with Dickel and Sweeten's Cove. And I had some other conversations this past week about really where we see with Kentucky um, being able to, there's a lot of investor barrels going down. And What's it going to be in four years? There's a lot of people think that they can turn it around and they'll sell it for three thousand. But you know, there's a bunch of people down that are putting investor barrels down. So who knows if that's what the market will will deem at that point? Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I was listening along for a little bit, and and so I, I think it. I, I mean, shoot, I don't. I, I think four years ago, none of us would have predicted where we are right now. So we should probably say that. But at the same time. Um, you know, where we're going to be four years from now, I just don't see it slowing down any more than where we are now. You know, uh, it, we see all the everybody jumping in and new brands starting, new brands selling. So I think it's going to be a really hard time to say, like, 
yep, it's going to slow down and all these barrels are just going to be sitting there um, and nobody's going to be buying. <laughs> Glad we got to hear from Blake's dog too while we're at it too. (laughs) Yeah. I'm extremely torn on this. Like, cause like Blake said, you know, when, when Barstown bourbon like came to Barstown and like, they're talking about their concept, you know? And I was like, it's like, Oh, it might work for a few people. I don't know, but I just don't see it working now. Like the amount of warehouses they have. And like, I was a damn fool and uh, I, I never could have predicted that. And, and, you know, the interest in American whiskey just keeps growing. And every time I travel, it blows me away how many people are just getting involved and they're younger. You know, they're they're 25 to 35 mostly and even even above that age. And it's like, holy cow. And then um, but you do see like BBC and now Green River having just so much you know i think bbc just finished like their 10th warehouse you know and green river has i don't know how much distillate but there's a ton there's a ton of celebrity bourbons coming from there and so i could also see that and then wilderness trail too hell they got you know people building their own damn warehouses you know just for contract distillation um so i can kind of see where there might be a flood of bourbon on the secondary market and it might drive prices down but but I also see how much new interest is in whiskey and I don't think it's going away and I think it's going to keep growing. So I'm, I, I don't know. I'm kind of in the middle on this. I, I don't know. I don't know how to predict it. <laughs> I wish I could. Yeah. I think that it, it is very unpredictable that that's kind of the hard thing. Um, but you know, I agree with Kenny when you're, you're out and talking to people, I'm sure Fred and Jordan, y'all say this too, when the, the amount of new people coming in, it's in a younger demographic. And my thing is, I, I just don't think tomorrow they're going to wake up and think, oh, I want to drink tequila or whatever the next new brand is. You know, I think the, you know, kind of the Americana and all that bourbon really grabs people a little bit deeper than just the the seltzer of the day or whatever it is. So I, I still think we have a whole nother generation to come through bourbon before it's starting to slow down at all and but, with the ky yeah, could like, be wrong it, it's people just mm-hmm. with bourbon they you know granted it, it that's the best marketing these distillers ever did you know they're like bourbon's made in kentucky and even though it doesn't have to be but a lot of people think it does and that ky you know means a lot and it means a lot to consumers and so it will always kind of hold that value and i know there'll be a shit ton of it but it's the only stuff that's from Kentucky. And so, and you know, it's the only one you can say it's from Kentucky, you know, cause it's, it's they've been aged here for a year and a day. And so, you know, that's the badge of honor, you know, I think Blake, you made an interesting comment about, you don't see people hopping to tequila or, or other stuff. Right. But, you know, I think that the thing that other, and maybe it's veering a little off course, but other spirits need to be wary of is bourbon was, and is the, the cheapest spirit for a lot of folks to get into just sipping neat. Right. So sip it, you know, they'll mix it and then they'll sip it neat. And once you start doing that at a low price point, then you do see some people say, oh, maybe I'll give a tequila shot. Maybe I'll give scotch, stuff like that. So not only do, you know, the whole industry needs to worry about what are they going to do with higher price barrels in the future, but then other alcohols um, they need to worry about too, because if bourbon keeps skyrocketing and barrels keep going up and they keep charging more and more, does another, does another category take over and start becoming the everyman spirit that people start drinking neat? and take away from that consumer base that uh, distillers need to worry about losing. There's also a lot of growth in Tennessee. You know, I know we focus a lot on uh, Kentucky, but I just met with the the secretary of uh, tourism there and they that state is about to go all in on bringing in new whiskey distillery and really changing things. And they were, they've been about a decade and a half, maybe two decades behind Kentucky. Yeah, and what the thing that the whole wild card too in this is if you know, I think Kenny, you've mentioned before, like Mike Shapiro says, if you convert, you know, if like you've converted like one of every ten scotch drink, you're you're going to wipe out all the age stocks of Heaven Hill has. If you if this European tax tariff ever gets tariff gets figured out and they get that away, you can just kiss all the stocks goodbye. I mean, it they ain't making enough, you know, because they want it over there. It's just too expensive. It's not affordable, you know, compared to scotch. But once it does, I mean, just look out, you know, if that ever gets figured out. Yeah, definitely. Well, and of course, uh, uh, they did suspend uh, the tariffs recently, uh, Europe and uh, 
United States to, decided to suspend him recently. But that they still haven't done it on bourbon. Bourbon. Bourbon still. Bourbon still hit. Yes. Dodge got relief from tariffs into the U.S., but we're not getting reliefs for bourbon into Europe. Which is crazy, but that's probably a whole other uh, roundtable topic. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's in progress. It's going hap- to happen. It'll happen this year. And if that does, then all of your worries about whiskey not selling for or not appreciating go out the window because that's just a whole nother continent that you're going to try to supply whiskey for. And, and that's not counting India or China or wherever, you know, that, yep, all Asia. Are, you know, China's middle class is rising like crazy. And, you know, if they start getting into bourbon and they're buying nicer and fancier things, you know, it's like, just, just look out. I mean, the world's bigger than you think, you know, we, we kind of live in a bubble here and, uh, it's, there's a lot of people out there, you know? Yeah. I really, I, I think that there's just, there's a lot, there's a lot of things happening right now in trade and just, I, I, it, things are moving in that direction to suspend them. I mean, I don't know where it's going to hit in other areas, but I think bourbon will be free probably in the next year. Fingers crossed. Free. <laughs> well, not free. <laughs> not tra- not tariff, free. Tariff, tariff free. Tariff no, free. I'm with you. Yeah. And I would yeah. think a, a silver lining with all this as a as a consumer is that if you think that there is so much available, and and by the way, some people are saying that what do you mean it? You know, three thousand dollars for a barrel. I just bought a new rip barrel. It cost me ten thousand. We're talking about on the source market, wholesale, buying direct, not once it hits retail kind of thing. So yeah, you still got to bottle it, package it. Send it to a distributor. <laughs> Keep all that in perspective. Um, now, one of the things that this, you know, as I said, as a as a retail consumer, this could eventually mean a little bit lower prices on the shelf because it's lower cost of goods. But time will tell with regard to that. There was a good question that came on here from Sammy. And do we think big players that are, you know, supplying whiskey like MGP, Dickel, Barton, and are they going to stop that supply in the future? Because they've all have house brands now, and they're all trying to take care of themselves. Um, you know, we've talked about this before about MGP kind of saying like this is still a part of their business, and with buying Luxco, what could be the eventual outcome of it? Uh, however, I don't know. Well, with Barton, Barton's interesting because they they're uh, they are becoming a private labeler, you know, more than more than a source putting their stuff out on wholesale. They're they're supplying Kroger, Total Wine, Liquor Barn. I mean, all of these private like so Costco, so Flatboat, uh, Walcott, um, Stonehammer. You know, those are all that's from Kroger, Liquor Barn, and Total Wine. Uh, those are all Barton, and that is that is their mission. There is to is to do those kinds of labels. Well, they also get a, a pretty good deal when you do something like that. It's it's less. I mean, it's less people to deal with. You have direct influence into brands and you have direct communication to them. It's a, it's an easy way to be able to sell off excess stock without having to go through the the hustle of everything of brokers and people like Ryan and I going, <laughs> where are the good barrels at? <laughs> yeah. So if they can, if they can then land, uh, let's say, so now, so let's say they add Walmart, Meyer, uh, Target. Yeah. Target sells actually a lot of bourbon. Walgreens sells bourbon. Let's say they get all of those major retailers that sell uh, spirits to have their own private label. I mean, then you're looking at that that stock for uh, wholesale and the brokerage side drying up. You know, so that would be to me that is the um, that's the bigger issue there. Instead of them say, putting it more into 1792 you know, fighting for those private labels, which is something that Green River is doing as well. So like every one of these like retailers, it's like they want Kentucky bourbon on the label. And so it's Green River, it's Barton. And who are they choosing out of those two usually? It's usually Barton. Yeah. Go at the higher age for sure. <laughs> yeah. But I do think they'll stop. I, I, I do think MGP and the I, I do think they're going to cut their sourcing business and focus more on the brands i think because there's more margin there's there's uh more value in that the brands are worth more than the whiskey and and uh, now they and now they have the resources you know luxco yeah. that acquisition for luxco That's that huge. couldn't come better for them because they were mgp was not equipped 
to to do the distribution and sales game. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if if MGP takes their stuff off of the market, it, I think they would take some things off. Like, I think some of that stuff would dry up. But I don't. I, I think light whiskey will be shoved down everyone's throat. Uh, and if King's Family Estate is any example of like light whiskey can be pretty tasty, um, you know that I think that's what MGP will be doing is is like they're not going to get out of the source game entirely. They're just going to say, "Oh, well, I know you want that bourbon, but come on over here and taste this uh, this light whiskey that everyone's talking about these days." Which no one is. <laughs> you want some yeah. Gin? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got a. We got, I know you, we don't have a Porsche 911 for you, but we got this great Camry that is more your style. Here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also right. So if MGP still does keep a little bit of bourbon on the side for the market, that they're not, you know, just to sell to to source out. Really, if they have a bunch of their own brands, it's probably not the cream of the crop that they're holding back for other folks either. So if there is if there is still stuff out there, it's probably, you know, it's not it's not gonna be something that most people are gonna be clamoring for, like maybe now. Yep. Yeah, it'd be interesting if they keep it up for like bullet rye, you know, like someone that massive. Uh, oh no, that will never go away. That's in yeah. that's a ironclad contract. Um that one will go away. For light perpetuity. Yeah. No, that's uh yeah, Diageo and their lawyers have got their meat hooks into that distillery for some time. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go ahead. We'll pivot to our last topic for the night. And that is who's more important, the master distiller or the salesperson? Now, Fred's wanting to talk about this one for a while. So I'll, I'll let you tee off here. How about that? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, apropos since I've been going back to tweets from two and three years ago, to do uh, uh, above the chars. This is a, this is like a two year old tweet um, that we were talking about. And this kind of stems from, uh, I learned a really prominent master distiller was making less than like district sales managers. Um, and it kind of, it varies by distilleries, but you know, most, most of them are making, uh, pretty strong six figures, you know, 200 to 400,000 a year. A lot of them are making 200 to 400,000 a year, but there's a few of them that are paying, you know, 60 to 80,000, which is a very nice living. Uh, don't get me wrong for all, you know, a lot of parts of the country, but master distillers kind of got this whole like, you know, thing to it. And, uh, I got to, got to doing some digging and some researching and, and I was thinking of like, how many people know about the master distillers from Maker's Mark? Not many. Uh, who? How many people know of who the master distiller was? You know, in in uh, Stitzel Weller in, in 1960. You know, not many people know uh, who Roy Hawes was or any any of those uh, people were. But they know Pappy Van Winkle and they know uh, Bill Samuels Jr. And those are people that or sales sales reps. And basically they were, they sold the product. And I, I have, and you have in the P in the master distillers who make more are more in sales roles, not the, not the creation of the product roles. So that I know is true. And what, what I have seen is, and I, I disagree with it. I think the master distiller is more important but what I have seen the industry do is they they put more uh, emphasis on the sales rep because they're moving cases over the master distiller who's creating the whiskey. So I think I think it's a it's a really and I think I know where most of us agree uh, on, on the topic, but it's the industry really rewards sales reps. <laughs> Let's well, but so, so, but I think that's all industries, honestly. If you look at, you know, you go into any business, you look at their um, commission structure, their comp plan, it, you'd be amazed at how, and even just smaller businesses, how much a salesperson can make if they're really good. And there's a reason for that too, right? And if it upsets people, then they need to reevaluate why they're upset because those salespeople are making sure that that company is selling a ton of, a ton of products, pushing a lot of revenue through the organization. And that's paying everybody else's paychecks, mind you, right? The jobs they do, and I'm not in sales whatsoever. You know, when I look at my own company's comp plan or others that I've worked for and run, 
that there's a reason that you, you know, really good salespeople are, are worth the money because they're keeping that company growing and they're pushing your product out there. Now, now do I feel bad for the master distiller that they're not the ones that are super well compensated because of it? Sure. But at the end of the day, they should be shaking those salespeople's hands because they're getting their product out there to the market. They're making sure that, that company's doing really well. And they're making sure that their own paycheck's able to grow. Cynical, yeah. But I mean, that's that's how it works, unfortunately. That's a really good way to put it. I mean, coming from the tech side as well, yes, you have, uh, there's a lot of margin to be made on software and salespeople can make a, a pretty healthy commission when you go in and you sell a $10 million deal, but the engineering teams don't get paid near that much and they don't see the commission off of it. But, you know, there's a bonus structure at the end of the year to kind of help balance it all out. And it's one thing to create a product. It's another thing that to think that if you, if you build it, they will come. You've, got to be able to have a sales force out there that that really pushes it. And that's what is going to make you be known at the end of the day. Yeah, I think I think uh, the the master distiller is I think it, it varies by brand. And it also is what it kind of goes a little bit too of what is a master distiller? You know, I mean, we, we that's a, another topic. But when you are when if you are the face of the brand, if you are the creator of it, I mean, I, I think you're more important than the salesperson. I, I'm sorry, but you're the creator and that person may not be out there selling and pitching, but they are they are the face and everything to the brand. They're the heartbeat and, you know, they're the soul of it. And the sales rep, that's great. I appreciate, you know, they're out there hustling and selling a very important part of the team, but uh, th there ain't no way a um, there ain't no way any sales rep president or anything is more important than than wild Tur wild turkeys Jimmy or Eddie Russell. Um, you know, there's no way that well those guys have already been elevated to a, a different stature. Well, that's and I was gonna say, and I think that makes a good point. Is like we're, we're kind of in like the food industry. We're turning our we're turning our master distillers into celebrities. So they're almost salesmen themselves. And I think that's kind of the hard part. They're no longer just the, you know, the operations manager of a manufacturing plant. They're shaking hands, they're doing tastings, they're doing podcasts, they're doing interviews. And so they're kind of on that sales side too. So I think that is kind of the tough part about it when you look at it, because they are the face of that brand a lot of times. And, you know, Fred brought up the Russells. What is wild turkey without Jimmy and Eddie Russell? And but that's not because they're turning knobs and at the distillery still. It's because we know them as the face. They're almost in that sales role as well. So it's it's kind of this weird quirk within the bourbon industry where the master distillers have also become the main sales reps because you know we've all been to tastings where you're there with the sales rep and they introduce the master distiller and they kind of play off of them a little bit so well let's not let's um, not also confuse sales reps with marketing there's sales reps are out there and they're trying to push cases that's true. jimmy and eddie russell aren't there trying to go to whatever distributor and be like so i have you down for 900 cases yeah <laughs> they, they're not doing that <laughs> it's true but the sales rep says hey if i get you jimmy and S eddie russell to come in can we count you down for 900 um sometime you, you know i i, I think um the the celebrity of the master distill in the bourbon world kind of throws throws things off in our minds. Yeah, and I think the you said it, Kenny. I think the most important is the marketing person who's creating the story to say this brand is because of Eddie and Jimmy. And you know damn well they haven't made any whiskey in for for I mean how long? I mean twenty years, ten years. I mean fifteen. You go in there, it's all automated. I mean. Every distillery, major distillery now is automated. You got assistant distillers, you got production teams, you know, who, who do all of it. Now they're in there doing quality control or, you know, picking single barrels and all that stuff. I mean, yes, the master distiller is important. I think it's less these days because of science and automation and manufacturing technology. And the, the story you sell in the selling, I think, is more important to me because you're saying the master of store is important. Well, who's telling that story that they're important marketing and sales, you know, and it's, you, they're, they're, they're like the wizard of Oz, you know, you go and they're like, Oh, the wizard, of, you know, the master of stillers has got this aura about them. And like, they're can turn, 
chicken shit and a chicken salad and do all these things with corn and all this. And, and then you go behind and you're like, well, they don't do shit here. You know, it's like all these people on the back end are doing it. You know, <laughs> I would love for today's Ryan Cecil to talk to the Ryan Cecil from three years ago, because I know that Ryan Cecil would have said master distiller all the way. <laughs> well, they're important. Uh, I don't know. It's, they're everybody's important it, you know everybody has their role and it, it all takes all different kinds of a, a person who makes whiskey doesn't want to go out and hassle distributors and liquor stores to push product for them and vice versa a salesman i couldn't go and sit on a manufacturing line and you know and do the same thing every day it just takes my dad always says it takes all kinds to make the world go around you know and that, that's everybody has value and nobody's more important than the other it's just un unfortunately the the way sometimes the economy and capitalism works is that yes the people that produce the most revenue get paid the most and that's for better or for worse that's the way it is and i think it's not the perfect system but it's the best system you know that's made every industry better but it's I don't to know. that to that point i think i think maker's mark is an example of how when the master distiller is not the face of of the brand they're they're replaceable you know in in my career it's been uh dave pickerel uh kevin smith greg davis denny potter and i think i feel like i'm missing one but i'm not i think so four four master distillers at maker's mark in my career and um and you know that whiskey has not changed you know so that's a that's an example of like if you're if you're making if you're making the argument for the sales rep, uh, then the master distiller cannot be the face of the brand. And I think if you take Harlan Wheatley, like Harlan Wheatley, to me, is you know, is the face of of uh, a Buffalo Trace. Now he there's a lot of faces of Buffalo Trace, but I think he's more important than whoever their their director of sales is i do you think because that whiskey sells itself well, well well here's my thing is and we all taste enough we see what sells um you know somebody put in the chat good whiskey sells itself uh, unfortunately that's not always the case i think there's plenty of really good whiskey out there that doesn't sell nearly as well as another whiskey that we think is not quite as good but has a better marketing, a better, you know, whatever, whatever that approach is in the market, whether that's a sales rep or just a PR team, um, it just does better. I mean, I mean, I see it all the time and, um, you know, it, we like to think that the best tasting thing is going to be the one that's going to be the most popular. And that's typically not the case. Um, it, it, it has to, be over a standard of good it has to be very good whiskey, but after it's, you know, is over that hurdle, it's kind of more on the sales rep, the story, the price, all that good stuff. So, I mean, here's my final thought on this one too, right? It's, it's a super crowded market right now. There is more bourbon brands out there than ever before. And while we're enthusiasts, everyone watching and listening, to this is a bourbon enthusiast by far and large, right? The majority of consumers aren't. And the first shot you have at even getting someone to buy your whiskey is making sure it's on the shelf available for them to purchase. And the person doing that is not your master stiller, it's your salesperson, right? I respect the hell out of master stillers, but they are not the ones getting that whiskey put on the shelf, especially when there's a hundred other brands that somebody walking down the aisle is looking to buy, right? So you need to make sure that your bottle is even on the shelf in a store before you have a shot of it being sold. Wow. So it is, it is concluded, Kenny, that... Everyone thinks sales reps are more important than master distillers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, there was, I didn't say they're more important. I just said, it's, uh, it's not, yeah, I guess, I guess the more important is, was the very bait clicky kind of way to do this. I mean, there was, there was a, uh, another good comment in the chat that says I could throw a rock and hit 10 good salespeople, but how many people would I hit of a master distiller at that same rock? And probably Boom. not, probably not as many. Boom. And it's, it's the same thing is that there's people that are, that are good engineers that can make great products, but they can't sell it. So if you make something great, you've got to have somebody that can sell it. And I think everybody goes back to Ryan's point is this is, everything is revenue driven and the best performers should get paid the most. And if you making that whiskey, since you're not, 
that's your cost center at, at the end of the day. That's what it comes down to your cost center. And if you're not driving revenue, then somebody else has got to pay for your salary. And that's where the salespeople come in. So I totally understand Ryan's point of making sure that the best performers get paid the most. Unfortunately, it's, I mean, but not unfortunately, but I don't know. <laughs> I, and I have respect for all master distillers and I love what they do. And yes, you're important. Everyone is important in this world and I love you. So no, oh, there we are. There he is. That's the wrap up right yeah. there. He's like, everyone is there you go. in this world. We'll see you next week. Thanks for- <laughs> By the way, I think Arlen Wheatley is, 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 is more important at B- Buffalo Trace because I think that's probably the most difficult distillery to run given how old it is and the fact that they have to have special wooden belts made for certain things. I mean, we underestimate what it's like to run a facility, you know, and, and like, Oh, totally. That, that man is actually running the facility. And that that's the genius of Harlan and of Denny Potter. It's not making whiskey. It's, you know, it's manufacturing and engineering genius. You know, you're you're looking at efficiency inefficiencies and always constantly improving, looking at bottlenecks and always looking how can we get our cost per unit down? And that's the the art that they do. It's not making whiskey. It's, you know, how can we streamline and make the processes better? Because they got the whiskey dialed in, you know, it's like rinse and well, One day I want to come back and figure out this whole wooden belt situation is because that's, <laughs> that sounds like an engineering <laughs> marvel. Belt made out of oh, I'll, I'll <laughs> send you, I'll send you my, uh, I think I wrote this in 2011 uh, for Whiskey Magazine. Yeah, I spent time with the this group at, uh, at Buffalo Trace. Their entire job was to, you know, they have all this ancient equipment from like the twenties and thirties and they have specialists who make, you know, belts and stuff for them. They've got these big tools that you've just never seen before. And it's just for fixing these random things. And if, it, if this, if the wooden belt doesn't work, then the dryers don't work. And if the dryers don't work, they don't have uh, they can't dry the grain. And if you can't dry the grain, you can't get rid of your spin grain. If you can't get rid of your spin grain, you can't distill. And so like everything in that distillery is like one wooden belt away from falling apart. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and just wrap this up because this is a great 58th round table. We had a lot of great topics and I think we might even touch on one of these again in the future because we didn't probably give it enough time. But uh, as we kind of close out, Blake, I'll let you give people a little bit of a heads up of where they can find find you. Yep. So uh, I'm Blake from Bourboner and Sealbox. Thank you all for being here. Um, You know, the streak continues, even though it was a little bit tardy. I do apologize, but uh, you can find me all the social medias um, and online, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. That's B-O-U-R-B-O-N-R or S-E-E-L-B-A-C-H-S dot com. So once again, guys, thanks for having me. I think three tardies in a row counts as a a whole episode <laughs> yeah, so an absence. No, uh, this is the first tardy in quite some time and i mean you did it on a sunday on father's day to an old email so i put this on kenny excuses, <laughs> excuses. wow <laughs> your turn jordan sure this is jordan one of the three guys from breaking bourbon you can find us at breaking bourbon.com and all the socials check us out for all of your bourbon review needs great And of course, follow Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your podcasts, as well as follow us on every social media platform. And you can also follow Fred Minnick, and he's got his own great Fred Minnick YouTube channel, which is also the inspiration for our first topic tonight. So make sure you go and subscribe. Make sure you subscribe and like this video as well. And with that, we'll kind of wrap it up in the famous words of Cecil here. We love everybody. Cheers. And you have value. Cheers, guys. (laughs)